Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I hope your day started off better than ours. I was doing my studies this morning, and the sun came up, and I thought, man, there sure is an awful lot of water standing in the backyard, and uh, we've got a leak, so I've already gone to Florence and back to get some parts for that, but you know, God's always on the throne, and God's always good, and the traffic was light, and the lights were green, and man, it was just a great trip this morning. It's good to have you. If you're visiting with us, first time, first time in a long time, or if you have a prayer request, I'm going to ask you to tear this little fly out of your bulletin this morning, put your name and address, maybe your phone number on there so I can reach out. If you have a prayer request, you can write that on there. If you don't want to mention it out, roll that up, slip it in my pocket, drop it in the offering plate. They come straight to me and nobody looks at those, so I encourage you to do so. Uh, just a few changes. On our bulletin this morning, um, we were planning to have a meal and a ministry fair Next Sunday, we're going to put that off. We've got a lot of sickness going around. We're just going to hold that off a little bit, going to continue talking about serving, priming the pump for that. And number two, we're going to hold up on our senior night that's coming up this week. We're going to push that back a little bit. Late breaking news, we're going to push that off for one week. So instead of that being uh, on the 27th, it will be the third, which will be Thursday the third. So I'm going to make a note on that. Make sure everybody everybody else does. I feel like Walter Cronkite. I need to take my glasses off. This is just in. So I do have a card uh, from Tim and Beth, and it says, We appreciate more than you'll ever know the kind gestures you sent out our way during the last couple of weeks. Your thoughtful calls, texts, and prayers meant so much to our family. Our church family is the greatest. And again, that's from... Tim and Beth, and we do want to ask you to continue to, to pray for them. Uh, be praying for Miss Sheena and her family. Uh, thank you so much for everybody that helped with the service here yesterday with the food and with the service. Uh, we just love you. We appreciate you so much. And I do want to give you an update on Brother Billy and Miss Danielle. Uh, they are sequestered, uh, quarantined, however you want to say it. Um, it has been pretty bad because Brother Billy has lost some of his appetite, which you know could be fatal for a man of... His eating stature, and Miss Danielle is really facing fatigue. I mean, it's really, really, she didn't need much, but this has really got her down. But so far, thank the Lord, Jessica is doing well. So we've been doing some porch drops there. So um, got a lot of other folks that are sick with it. Uh, seems like every house in our neighborhood has got it on both sides. Uh, so just be mindful of that and be cautious. And uh, be calling and checking on folks and letting them know that you love them, that you miss them, and is there anything we can do for them? I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate Brother Bobby filling in for us this morning. Be praying for him as he does yeoman's work for us there. Father, we love you, and God, we just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Lord, how you've just watched over us. God, how you've protected us. Lord, we've got a lot around us that are sick. Father, those among us that are hurting. We're just asking, Lord, that you'd be all things that we need this morning, Lord, that you would speak grace, that, God, you would calm us, Lord, that, Father, you would just give us that staying power, Lord, to keep our focus on you, Lord, even if the boat's filling up with water. God, we trust that you're with us. And, God, you said, let us go to the other side. Father, as we sing, I pray that it just is sweet savor to you, Lord, and that, God, we sing to you. And, Father, we are making that joyful noise, Lord. Thank you for letting us be together this morning. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Bob. If you would remain standing, uh, when they asked me to do this this morning, I said, well, you know what you're going to get. You get what old songs that I grew up singing. Uh, I looked last night in, in the hymn that I had, and and I think the newest song that we're singing today is close to 100 years old. Uh, some of them are two and 300 years old. You know, I don't, if you go out and turn in, turn the radio on in my vehicle, it's set to a either 91.3 or the message on satellite radio. It's good music to listen to, but you wouldn't want me leading it. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I think back, if you were in Sunday school or if you're going to pay attention when Jonathan's preaching, we're, we're studying out of a book that's 
two or three thousand years old. So it's not going to hurt us to sing a couple of hundred year old songs. Uh, we're going to start out with 148 and we'll just progress through. <clears throat> There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Jesus. 
appreciate it. Good morning again. Um, one thing I forgot to announce, the obvious, is we're still holding up on our Wednesday nights. So make sure you liked and subscribed and hit whatever those buttons are on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, that way you know our social media accounts so that you know when we have to make some alterations, we have to do some things on the fly, that way you know. Of course, you're always welcome to call us and let us know, ask us, you know, what's going on. Uh, just make sure that, that we can keep you in the loop as best we can because the climate is kind of changing. We're hoping and praying that this thing flushes itself through in the next week or so and we can kind of get back to whatever normal looks like again. You know, as I said, opening up an announcement, I have already made a trip to Florence and back. And even though it was on a Sunday morning, even though it was kind of early, it was still in the 10 o'clock range. And I bet I passed, you know, half a dozen churches that, that didn't have any cars in the parking lot yet even at 10 o'clock. So that tells you that we're not the only ones that's kind of feeling the crunch and hurting. So we do need to be mindful of what's going on around us. We do need to be praying, and uh, we need to be calling out the Lord. And that was what I really hit on uh, Wednesday night, you know, the prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And it's the fervent prayer. So in your mind, who do you go to for those prayers? And in somebody else's mind... Do they see you for those prayers? Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll see what the Lord has for us. And Father, as we call out to you this morning, Lord, Father, our minds are, are, are racing. Father, we have hurts, we have aches, we have cares and concerns, Lord. We've got a lot of burdens. And Father, we're calling out to you this morning, Lord, to give us some peace. Father, stand up on the bow of our boat, Lord, and just say, not to the wind and the waves, but, Father, to the situations in our life. Say, peace, be still. Father, we lift up our brother that's sick at home this morning, Lord, as he prays for us with his wife and his daughter. God, we lift them up to give them a healing, a cleansing, Lord. God, we pray for our other loved ones, Lord, that are sick, that are traveling, that are out of, out of country, Lord, out of town, out of county. God, we pray for all the needs that's going on, Lord, the peripherals that, that are chewing at us from the corners, Lord. God, all the things that try to take our focus off You, I pray that You bar them at the door this morning so we can hear a word from You, Lord, so that we can ask ourselves, am I in the attitude to serve? God, have we got our service clothes on, our boots, our gloves, our hat, our, our jacket, are we wearing our safety gear, Lord? Are we ready? God, are we ready for what you're telling us we need to do? God, speak. Speak through me. Speak loud and speak clear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our attitude to serve. I want to ask you, what should our attitude be in order to serve properly? You've often said, I've got to just put my mind to it. I've just got to wait until my back quits hurting. There's always something that we have to move out of the way so that we can do whatever it is we need to do. But what about our mental attitude to be able to serve God? Look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul wrote chapter 13 to the church at Corinth, and we're only going to catch the tail end of it. This is another one of those situations where there's more meat on this bone than we can chew on this morning. But he's writing to the church at Corinth about charity, which is love, and how it never should fail. Paul says it never fails. But truth be known, do we continually love? Do we continually provide charity for those around us? So in uh, 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 11, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. 
these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now Paul is telling us here that, you know, I once was a child, and I think we all once can say that we was if we're up to a certain spot. And the older I get, it seems like the younger, you know, old is. I mean, you look at kids driving down the road and it looked like they just put the bottle down to get behind the wheel of the car. I mean, it's scary. And I'm sure some of y'all thought that about us when we started driving. But Paul says, believe it or not, I once was a child. And when I was a child, obviously I spoke like a child. There was some ignorance in that. There was some unlearned speaking. And he said, I understood as a child. Do you remember back when you thought you knew everything? And then the day came when you realized you really didn't know everything. I remember the shock, and there's been shock of many times when I thought I knew exactly how to do something, only to find out I did not. And Paul says, you know, I, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, but then he says, I grew up, I became a man. And ladies, that does not exclude you. He's talking about growing up and putting away those childish things. He talks about looking through a glass. Now, you got to understand, back in those days, they didn't have the glass that we have today that is literally invisible. They had that brown, dark, uh, kind of heated, compressed sand. And he said, but there's going to come a day when I'm going to see clearly. And he said, there are three things that will abide forever. Faith, hope, and charity. So, what should our attitude be in order to serve properly? Firstly, we need faith. We have got to have faith. We've got to have these three things in our life so you know what the three points are today. We've got to have faith being a confidence or a trust in a person or a thing. Belief that is not based on proof. If you've ever had to go somewhere, you had to have faith in the automobile. You had to have Faith in your ability to get there. You had to have faith that there's not going to be a traffic jam somewhere. You've ever worked with somebody that followed you up or you followed them up. You had to have faith in each other. So you understand what faith is, but what about true faith in God? Do we have true faith in our God? Paul said in verse 12, as a child, we will, as a child of God, we will see God, we will see Him face to face someday, but do we trust God? We may say, you know, I've put faith in God for all of eternity, but I'm doing it my way today. I have faith in God for tomorrow, but not necessarily today. Is there any historical evidence that you can show that God has failed you before? I think that's kind of a sobering question. Has God ever failed you before? Why are you not trusting Him with today? Does our lack of faith in God taint our faith in His future? Not our future, but His future. If we won't trust God with a situation in our life today, that means that we really are not trusting Him for the situations that come tomorrow, right? If we want to have an attitude of service, we've got to have Faith in God. Then we've got to have faith in ourselves. We have to trust that the good work that God has started in us is in fact there. I looked up and God told Isaiah and Jeremiah the exact thing. Exactly. He said, I have put my words in thy mouth. Two great prophets. He said, I put my words in your mouth. Yet why are we so afraid to speak? Well, I'm not Isaiah. And I'm not Jeremiah. But we're afraid to speak because we don't know what to say because we may say the wrong thing. Because we don't realize that as a child of God, He has put His words in our mouth. But why are we afraid to speak? Why are we afraid to serve? Why are we so tired to work? Why do we have such little faith in ourselves? Is it because maybe there's historical evidence where we have let ourselves down. The Bible study that the ladies are going through is talking about forgiving those things that we can't forget. You know, you can't forgive anybody else until you forgive yourself. You have to lay down those, those failures that have been in your life. Leave them. Repent of those things and walk away from those things. If we don't have confidence in God, if we don't have confidence in ourselves, then how can we have confidence in others? 
We are not a collective of individuals. We are a church family. We've got to have faith in God, faith in ourselves, and faith in others. How many times has our trust been misplaced in somebody else? We ask children all the time, who's your best friend? Well, it's so-and-so. How did they become your best friend? You had to start trusting them, right? And you learn pretty quick which ones you can tell something to and which ones you cannot. You know, that, that never goes away, folks. Maybe as a child, we had, in, in living as a child, we tried to put our faith in others, living the life of a child, speaking as a child, understanding as a child, thinking as a child, realizing that children are still trying to figure it all out. That's why they grow up. That's why we send them to school. We bring them to church. We teach them in our homes. We try to teach them how to speak as an adult. How to understand as an adult. How to think as an adult. But maybe even as an adult, we're still speaking as children. We're still understanding as children. We're still thinking as children. Has someone hurt our ability to have faith? To have confidence in others? Is there somebody in our life, that has so hurt us. Paul, uh, King David said it this way, he says in Psalm 41.9, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. You know, when you go to stomp something, you don't stomp with the front of your foot, you do it with the heel, that way you get the maximum force, right? What King David is saying, that my friend that ate my bread has hurt me? Has that ever happened to you and caused you to lose faith in others? Therefore, you've lost faith in yourself and maybe you've lost faith in God. Because those things are building blocks standing upon top of each other. Losing faith in others leads to lost faith in ourselves. Losing faith in others leads to lost faith in God. And lost faith in God prevents us from serving. Because we have no strength His mama used to say, you don't have a leg to stand on. We need faith. We need hope. Hope being the feeling uh, that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. My favorite analogy is hope to retire. Hope to make it to Friday. Hope to make it to Monday morning. Hope to get here. Hope to get there. This is what I want. But what about in our life, do we have a hope to grow? And I'm not talking about out, and I'm not talking about up. I'm talking about growing from a child into an adult. So that we no longer speak like a child, think like a child, act like a child. Grow to put away childish things. Put away unproductive language. If you think about idle chit-chat, think about all the words that you speak in your life that are not for God. Yesterday at the memorial service, Sister Sheena was privileged to be able to stand and to be able to talk about her sister, Deborah. And she was able to share her sister's testimony. And you know how she was able to share her sister's testimony? Because she found out about it. Now you imagine, at the end of life, And you have the opportunity to go talk to somebody and you're so burdened about their salvation and yet you want to talk about sports with them. You want to talk about politics with them. You want to talk about the weather with them. You want to talk about all those things that have nothing to do with that person's eternal salvation. Unproductive language. What about unproductive understanding? I can't. You ever heard that? I can't do it. I I am not capable of this. This is above my pay grade. Can't? Never could, folks. I can't, but God can. What about unproductive thinking? Have you ever said that even God cannot save that person? Even God cannot change that person? I believe it was one of the the great golfers one time that said even God can't hit a two-iron. I mean, and they don't even make those things anymore. Have you ever said something? You may not have said it out loud, but you thought it. Man, that'll never change, meaning even God can't change it. We want the future to turn out for the best, right? What about our spiritual profitability? Do we want that to turn out for the best? Hope to grow, hope to see. We all want clear vision. 
I mean, we don't want to be looking through that dark lens in verse 12 that he's talking about, the clouds, everything. You ever said hindsight is 2020? You know, because you can look back and say, yep, right there is where I stepped in it. See, I mean, I know I didn't see it coming up to it, but I see now where this went wrong, where I came off the rails. Can we look back now and clearly see the hand of God and how it has been at work in our life to bring us to the place that we are today? And you go back to whenever it was, and you think, how in the world did I find myself in this situation? I don't know what to do. I don't know which way to go. And now you can look here and see... God stopped forward progress. And God said, we're going to change things. Hope to see. We all want clear vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. No vision for today or no vision for tomorrow? Or does it matter? If you don't have one for today, what good is it to have one for tomorrow? Because tomorrow's never going to come. It's always going to be today. What about hope to live? What does it mean to live? In your mind, when you talk to somebody about living, what do you tell them? Do you define living by the things that are in your life? Do you define living by the persons that are in your life? Do you define living by the actions that you do? What is it that quantifies and qualifies your life? In other words, you have a moment to where you say, Man, this is the life. What's going on right then when you say that? just can't get any better than this man this is the life how much of God is involved in that how much faith in God brought you to that place how much hope of what God's going to do in you brought you to that place have we lost our hope maybe we don't like the political climate maybe we don't like this pandemic that's going on maybe we don't like the sports teams Maybe we found ourselves in a relationship and we're starting to lose hope. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Have we got so far away from God it just feels like hope is fading? Like looking through a cloudy glass? Lastly, we need love. You've got to have faith. You've got to have hope. You've got to have love. King James says charity which is something given to a person or persons in need. Most other translations say love, which is a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. So you're giving something passionate, something profound to somebody in need. Do we have love in ourselves? You know, it's hard to love somebody else if you don't love yourself. I mean, are you? T it may be that you've heard the term narcissist. And you're afraid to death of being a narcissist. That's somebody that can't see the flaws in themselves. They love themselves and they think they're always right. And everything's worked back to them. Do, do you sit down in your chair at night and, and say that I am proud of the accomplishments that I've done today? How much of that was done for God? When we come to the end of it all and we're starting to rack up the things that we've done and we're starting to lay them aside and we're starting to say, you know, I've accomplished this in my life and this in my life and this in my life. What have I done for God? How much love have I had that I was profoundly tender, passionate, giving love to those people that are in need? Are you proud of your accomplishments that you've made for God? Proverbs 19.8 says, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. So love of oneself goes hand in hand with wisdom. If we can't love ourselves, how can we love somebody else? If we don't see our own self-worth, how can we portray self-worth to somebody else? You've got to love yourself. You've got to love your family. Does your family know we love them? Sheena, when she talked about Deborah yesterday, and I may be, I may be third cousins, but I, I, I don't remember being around Deb that much. I mean, I always remember Sheena because she was closer in age to me. But the, the, the privilege of just saying, I love you. And she went through her family, and she told each member of her family, like when my dad passed, I was able to tell them, 
you know, the love that my parents had for them, that I had for them. Does our family know we love them? Or do we say, you know, I get out and work every day and I give them money. They ought to know I love them. I shouldn't have to tell them I love them. They should not have to see me be profoundly tender and passionate, giving them the things that they need, which may just be a set of ears. It may just be a hand. It may just be somebody to sit with and watch television with on the couch. It may be to turn off all of whatever we got going and focus on them. Does your family know that you love them? Do we tell them the love that Jesus Christ has for them? How hard is it to tell somebody that Jesus loves them and you love them and they say, but I don't love you back? Am I the only one that can raise a hand on that one? I don't love you. I don't love you, God. I don't want a part of you. But do we still show them the love that Jesus put in our life? God didn't call us to just sit and soak. God called us to love. Do you know the testimony of your family members? You see, yesterday, Sheena said, I can share the testimony of my sister because I asked. I wanted to know. Does your family know Jesus? You see, Mark 8.36 says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now, I know that's talking about my own soul. But I am married to my wife, and the two have become one flesh. So my soul is also her soul. Our souls are knit together. King David said that about his friend Jonathan. Our souls are knit together, so therefore my friends, they are my own soul. My daughters, they have to be my own soul. So what would it gain me if I, if I had the whole world and they died and went straight to hell? We ought to love our family like we love ourselves, don't we? Are we portraying love in our life? I drive this four lane to Decatur and back every day. My vice president goes in before I do. You would think driving 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, they wouldn't be what we see. It doesn't feel like love. I mean, there's just hate discontent it's on the news it's in the media is there love in, in our life how many of us are scared to put one of those little Jesus fish stickers on the trunk of our car or the back window of our car because we don't know who's going to see it and think is that the love that they got in their life how much love do we see in this day and age you know, you can find the good in everything. You can find the bad in everything. You know, you can look and peel and, and, and get far enough. How much love do we really see? Do we like the direction our country is heading? Do we like the direction the church is going where we're just separating? Do we like that? Or do we want to see love? Do we want to display love? Do we want to have faith that God has got this, that we just stay faithful? Do we want to have hope that God has got a better day in store for us, and how many can we take with us? And do we want to show love to those that are lost and dying around us? Because John said in 1 John 4, 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. And it's hard to say, I have love in my heart if I don't have God. And it's hard to say I have God in my heart if I don't have love. We were in here last night cleaning up after the service. And everybody was taking, you know, what had been given for them. And we left the mailbox. And they were saying, You really sure you want to put a mailbox in front of the pulpit? And I said, sure, I'll preach on bringing the mail. You know me, I'll work it in somehow. But see, Deb worked for the post office. So the family, the, the brothers and the sisters, made this display for her. And I wanted to leave it sitting down here because I think our life a lot is like a mailbox. And I know 
Some of you used to mark the fenders of your trucks because you run them over and hit them, and people like to put fireworks in and blow the lid off. And I mean, we have a lot of fun. That's a federal offense, by the way. But if you think about that mailbox, it's out on the road of our life, isn't it? I mean, it's standing there. It's every day. It's every night. You know, sleet or rain or snow or, you know, nothing's going to stop the mail from running. And it's got a door on it. And we typically like to keep that door closed. And we also like to keep this flag down, meaning that, that we're just receiving. We're getting. We're taking. So as God speaks, our flag is down, right? But at some point, that mailbox is going to fill up. So you've got to go buy a bigger mailbox, right? No, you open the door and you take it out. If you like my house, you have half your bills are electronical and they just go straight in. You don't even have to get a piece of paper, but there's some that you still have to mail back. So when you get that, whatever it is, or you want to do something, you have to raise that flag up. And that tells the male person, there's something in there for you. Now you imagine that mailbox is our life. What's God put in there for somebody else? How much is God going to have to stuff into our life until we raise the flag and say, hey, listen, i got something for you. I've got faith that this is not my home. I've got hope that there is a better day coming. And I've got love because Jesus died for me. And He also died for you. So do you know Jesus? Do you have that faith? Do you have that hope? Do you have that love? Because you see, that may be the last chance you get to ask that person. And I wasted it talking about politics or football, or fishing, or things. How many of our mailboxes are literally overflowing? We need to raise the flag. We need to start letting some stuff out. We need to start telling, listen, I'm ready to serve. I've got to get my attitude in order to be able to do that. I'm going to ask you to bow with me this morning. I just want to know, are you where God wants you to be? Are you serving in the capacity that God has called you to serve? How much more is God going to try to stuff in our mailbox until there literally is no more room? Father, it's my prayer this morning, Lord, that you spoke. God, that you spoke loud. God, that you spoke clear. What is our attitude towards service? What is our attitude towards you? What is our attitude toward others? Lord, I pray this morning that you move. Father, thank you for the emotions that we've seen, Lord. We know that you're dealing with us this morning. God, we just pray for the courage and the strength to step out and do what you're leading.